next speaker event, and I'm absolutely delighted that Dr. Bruce Grayson is going to be our speaker. And as we've witnessed with some other speakers in this conference, I am honored today that in addition to introducing Dr. Bruce Grayson, I am also going to be inducting him into the circle of honor. So let me just uh, put him up on the screen with me so you can see uh, Bruce's face. Hi, Bruce. Uh, and as I've mentioned previously, uh, some of you may not have heard, but Spiritual Awakenings International has a circle of honor. And this is like our version of a Hall of Fame. And this is where we acknowledge outstanding individuals who've been groundbreakers and pioneers in the range of spiritually transformative experiences in the last hundred years or so. And we do hope to have an in-person induction ceremony, but with COVID, who knows when that's going to be. So now we are doing a verbal tribute and induction when that person presents. And we are delighted to have Dr. Bruce Grayson presenting today. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Bruce Grayson. So as most of you probably know, he is a psychiatrist based in the United States. And he is being acknowledged for his groundbreaking work on near-death experiences. He is the co-founder and past president of IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. He also was the longtime editor of the Journal of Near-Death Studies, which is the only peer-reviewed academic journal that is devoted to research relating to near-death experiences. And he did that from 1982 till 2008. Wow, long time. Um, Dr. Bruce Grayson has also been recognized. He, was, he is currently the Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. He taught on the medical faculty at the University of Michigan, and he taught at the University of Connecticut, and he also taught at the University of Virginia. His research for the past, past four days has focused on near-death experiences and particularly their after effects and implications. He developed an NDE uh, rating scale, which has become a gold standard for many researchers uh, who are trying to quantify near-death experiences. His NDE scale has been translated into 20 languages. Can you believe it? And used in hundreds of studies worldwide. He's won several research awards, including the William James Award, the William C. Menninger Award, the Central Neuropsychiatric Association Award, and the Outstanding Contribution Award from the Parapsychological Association. He is also a Distinguished Life Fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. So he has been recognized on many fronts. In 1995, he held the endowed Chester F. Carlson Professorship and was also director of the Division of Perceptual Studies. He has published more than 100 articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals, 37 invited book chapters, and four books. He's also the author of a brand new book just came out, which is entitled After a Doctor Explores What Near-Death Experiences Reveal About Life and Beyond. And it is the culmination of almost half a century of Dr. Grayson, Grayson's scientific research. So please, if you'd all give a hand now, a silent uh, hand to Dr. Bruce Grayson, congratulating him on his induction into the Spiritual Awakenings International Circle of Honor. Congratulations, Bruce. Thank you, Yvonne, for that wonderful introduction. You're welcome. So please uh, go ahead with your talk now. Okay. Well, as Yvonne mentioned, I've been studying um, near-death experiences for almost a half century. But I was raised in a, uh, a hardcore scientific household, a very materialistic household, where there was no uh, spiritual or religious background. It just never was a topic of conversation in our family. 
So I was raised with the idea that uh, the physical world is all there is, and when you die, that's the end, and that was just the way life was. That was fine with us. So when I first started encountering near-death experiences, uh, before there was a word for them, I wasn't sure what to make of them. Uh, being a psychiatrist, I, of course, thought these are uh, hallucinations, delusions. I just found them hard to take seriously, hard to believe. And it wasn't until several years later that Raymond Moody, who was also working with me at the University of Virginia, published a book called Life After Life, in which he gave us the name near-death experience and described what they were like. And it occurred to me for the first time then that these things I've been hearing from patients uh, were really not just delusions, but were a part of a worldwide phenomenon that was actually quite common. I still couldn't make any sense of them from my materialistic mindset. So I decided as a scientist and as a skeptic, the only intellectually honest thing to do was to try to study it and try to figure it out. So I dove in to try to do that. And uh, 50 years later, I'm still trying to do that. But over the decades, uh, I've come to appreciate how common and how important these experiences really are. And that's what I wanna share with you today, what I've learned about near-death experiences. So just so we're all on the same page, let me tell you what I mean by near-death experience. Uh, I've had people tell me that's, you know, when, when someone, someone sitting next to you on the bus dies. No, that's not what I mean. A near-death experience is a profound experience that many people have when they're on the threshold of death or pronounced dead that have anomalous, unexplained types of features in them and lead to profound long-lasting after effects. Before I get into talking about NDEs, I wanna talk about the problems that we have trying to study them. The first problem was that when we first started working with these uh, cases in the late 1970s and early 1980s, we were relying on people coming forth to say to us, I've had an experience like this, let me tell you about it. And everything we heard was a blissful experience. No one came forth and said, I had this horrible experience, let me tell you about it. So we thought that the blissful experiences were all there were. And it wasn't until we started studying entire cohorts of patients who are admitted to the hospital with, for example, a near a, uh, cardiac arrest and asking them all what they experienced that we started to hear a wider range of experiences. Uh, some were uh, quite frightening. And it became obvious to us that these are difficult experiences to talk about. So people don't talk about them unless you ask for them. So that problem of bias samples still plays us to some extent, depending on how you go about selecting your samples to look at. Another problem is the ineffability of these experiences. Almost every experiencer will start their story by saying, well, uh, of course, uh, words don't do it justice. So we researchers, of course, say, great, tell me about it. So we know we're making them distort the experience by putting it into words. One experiencer told me that it was like trying to draw an odor with a crayon. You just can't do it. So they end up resorting to whatever metaphors they have available to them to describe what happened to them. And of course, the metaphors that people have come from their culture and from their religious background. And that leads to the next problem, the cultural influence on the stories we hear. Some people dismiss NDEs because they are so influenced by culture. But if you look carefully at what's going on here, the culture does not influence what people experience, but only how they describe it, how they interpret it. For example, people all over the world will talk about encountering a warm, loving being of light. And if you're talking to a Christian, they may say, this was God, or this was Christ. If you're talking to a Hindu or a Buddhist, they won't use those words. They're not talking about different experiences. They're interpreting the experience or describing it in different ways. And in fact, many Christians will say to me, I'm going to use the word God to describe this, but that's just so you know what I'm talking about. It wasn't like the God I was taught in back in church. It was much bigger than that. Another problem is that many near-death experiences are reluctant to reveal 
the experience. Partly because they fear being ridiculed or labeled or misunderstood. And sometimes just because they feel it's such a personal experience that it would somehow profane it to share it with somebody else. It was meant for them and they don't wanna share it. Another problem in doing research is that when we started out, we had very inconsistent protocols. Each researcher was working in his or her own institution in fairly, uh, fairly isolated circumstances. So we were never really sure whether a researcher in Boston was talking about the same experience that a researcher in San Francisco was because they had different definitions of NDEs. Uh, they had different sets of questions they were asking about them. So it wasn't until 1983 that we developed the NDE scale that Yvonne mentioned that gave us a consistent definition of NDEs and a consistent set of questions to define them, to ask about. So once we deal with these questions, you have a problem of how to deal, how to establish that these are real experiences. Astronomer Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, distinguished between objective and subjective truth. And what he meant by that is, subjective truth is something that you know to be true, but you really can't share with anyone else. No one else can verify it for you. Whereas objective truth are things that other people can verify, and that are the same regardless of your personal belief system. He thought that near-death experiences were subjective truths, and I would argue with that, because even though the individual experience is subjective and only you know about it, if you look at experiences across the globe, thousands of them, you'll find that they are, there are some consistent patterns that are consistent regardless of your personal beliefs. So in that sense, and in the sense that some features of NDEs can be corroborated by third parties, I think you have to say that these are objective truths. Many people dismiss NDEs as expectation and wishful thinking. And that is based on your cultural models, what you think is going to happen when you die. But the data from several studies now have shown that NDEs are independent of your cultural models. They're certainly different from what most religions tell us is going to happen after you die. Most Americans now, in fact, most people around the world now, think of NDEs in terms of the model that Raymond Moody proposed in 1975. The familiar themes of uh, leaving the body, going through a tunnel, seeing a light, seeing deceased loved ones, a life review. And that's the way most people think about NDEs. But at the University of Virginia, we've been collecting these accounts for a good decade before Moody wrote his book, before anyone knew what to expect. So we looked at some of those early studies, that we, early accounts we collected in 1960s and the early 1970s. And we compared them with a matched group of people we collected stories from recently. And we found absolutely no difference. Before anyone had heard of Moody's uh, model, they described the identical NDEs that we hear today. We also see the same NDEs from cultures around the world and in fact, if you go back to the ancient literature of Greece and Rome and Egypt, you see the same kinds of NDEs that we have today. So the cultural uh, expectations, the religious expectations, do not seem to determine what you will experience in an NDE. Furthermore, memories of NDEs remain stable over decades. Because I've been doing this research for 40 years now, I've been able to go back and contact near-death experiences that I interviewed 20, 30, 40 years ago, and interview them again, and ask them to tell me again what their NDE was like. And I found that there was no difference between what they told me 30, 40 years ago and what they tell me now. The memory is not embellished over time, as people say, it is, remains stable. Most near-death experiencers will say that their experience was realer than real. What happened to them in the other realm, the other dimension, was more real than this physical world is. Well, that by itself doesn't prove anything, but there is a, a scale that's been developed to differentiate memories of real events from memories of events that didn't happen, from false memories. I gave this scale to near-death experiencers and I asked them to rate the memory of the NDE and the memory of another significant event from that same period in their lives and also to rate the memory of something from that same time in their lives 
that didn't happen, something they expected to happen but didn't, or a vivid dream or a fantasy. And what we found was that the memories of the NDEs look more like the memories of real events than the memories of imagined events. But furthermore, on this scale, the memories of NDEs looked more real than memories of real events, which is exactly what NDEers have been telling us for years. So what are the consistent features that occur in NDEs across cultures and across time? There are changes in thinking, thoughts going faster and clearer than ever before, a sense of timelessness. Many people say there was no time in the other realm. It's as if everything was happening all at once or there just wasn't a sense of time. Now that was a paradox for me because when they tell me about the NDE, it sounds like they're talking about a sequence of events. This happened and then this happened and then this happened. And I don't understand how you can have a sequence of events without time passing. And when I ask NDEers about this, they say, yes, when we talk about it here in this physical world, it's a paradox. But when I was over there experiencing it, it wasn't a paradox at all. Things were happening in sequence and at the same time all at once. And that wasn't a paradox there. That's just the way it was. People also report a life review, seeing their entire lives, more than seeing, reliving their entire lives. And about 80% of those who report a life review also report re-experiencing their life review, not only through their own eyes, but also through the eyes of other people involved in the situation. Let me give you an example of that. Tom Sawyer had an NDE in his 30s when a truck he was working under fell and crushed him in the crushed his chest. He had a very elaborate life review in his near-death experience at the time and went through almost every event in his life in great detail. And the one that impressed me most was he remembered a time when he was a teenager and he was driving his truck down the street and a drunk man ran in front of him. He jammed on the brakes and was furious because the guy almost dented his truck, God forbid. So he rolled down the window and started yelling at the man. And the man being intoxicated and not thinking clearly, reached his hand in the window and slapped Tom across the face. Uh, I was too much for this high-headed teenager. So he got out of the truck and started beating the man up and left him a bloody mass in the median strip, calmly got back into his truck and drove away. Well, when he had his life review, he experienced that event, not only through his own eyes, feeling the rage and the adrenaline rush, but also through the eyes of the drunk man, feeling the humiliation of being beaten up by this kid, feeling the 32 blows of Tom's fists in his face, feeling his nose getting bloody, feeling his teeth going through his lower lip. And Tom came back from that life review, realizing that there's no difference between me and that man. We're all in this together. We're all part of the same thing. And that will, what you do to somebody else, you're doing to yourself. And that's an essential part of many, many life reviews. There's also a sense of revelation or sudden understanding of everything. There are also consistent changes in emotional state or feeling, a sense of overwhelming peace and well being, a sense of joy, a sense of cosmic unity or being one with everything, and a feeling of unconditional love coming from some divine source. There are also what we call paranormal features, for lack of a, of a better term. Your normal senses, vision, hearing, and so forth, being much more vivid than they have been in this life. People talk about seeing colors they've never seen before, hearing sounds they've never heard before. There's also a sense of frank extrasensory perception, um, seeing things that are beyond the range of your, your vision. People often report future visions, seeing often in the life review, a life preview, things that haven't happened yet in your life, but later on come true. And a sense of leaving the physical body and often looking down and seeing your body from an out of body perspective. An important part of this is that they often can report things that they see from an out of body perspective that are unexpected, but very accurate. Let me give you an example of this. One fellow I knew was a 55 year old truck driver, Al, who 
on his rounds one day, started having crushing chest pain. And working in a hospital, he uh, realized what this was. So he drove himself to the nearest emergency room where he was evaluated. They found that four vessels going to his heart were blocked. So he was prepped and rushed to the operating room for emergency quadruple bypass surgery. Shortly into that operation, he reported leaving his body and looking down and watching the operating room procedures. And he saw his surgeon flapping his arms as if he was trying to fly. And he demonstrated to me like this. At this point, I've been a doctor about 30 years. I had never seen or heard of anything so ludicrous in my life. You don't see doctors on TV doing that. So I was sure this was a hallucination, but he insisted it was true. So several days after the operation, with his permission, in fact, with his insistence, I talked to his surgeon. And the surgeon sheepishly admitted that, yes, this was entirely true. He had developed this habit that he'd never seen anyone else do, where he would let his assistant start the procedure while he got on his sterile gown and gloves. Then he would walk into the operating room and watch them start the procedure. And while he was watching, he wanted to avoid touching anything that wasn't in the sterile field. So he placed his hands with his palms against his chest so he knew he wouldn't touch anything. And then he pointed out things to his assistants with his elbows so he wouldn't touch anything inadvertently. And it's just like Al saw. Now there's no way he could have known about that. No other doctor has ever done that as far as I know. And yet somehow he knew about it. How? Well, as he said, I saw it. There are also otherworldly features that are common to many NDEs a sense of being in some other realm or dimension, a sense of meeting some mystical being, uh, seeing deceased spirits or religious spirits, and coming to a border or point of no return beyond what you can't keep going and return to life. So how do scientists try to explain these strange events? There are a number of physiological explanations that have been proposed. One was that there was a lack of oxygen near death that at least contributes to near-death experiences. Well, we know what happens when you get lack of oxygen to the brain. You become agitated, frightened, belligerent, confused, nothing at all like the calm, a clear, consistent near-death experience. Beyond this, there have been studies in the US such as by Michael Sabom and in the UK by Sam Parnia, in which people have measured the oxygenation in people who are approaching death. And we have found that those who report near-death experiences actually have better oxygen supply to the brain than those who don't report NDEs. So clearly lack of oxygen is not causing the NDE. Likewise, drugs given to patients near death, the more, pa more, more drugs people are given, the less likely they are to report a near-death experience. And if they do report them, the less elaborate they're going to be. So drugs aren't causing NDEs, like lack of oxygen, they're inhibiting the NDE. There are also reports that, or claims that chemicals produced by the brain, stress chemicals near death are contributing, if not causing to the NDE. Well, that's a, that's a, a, an appealing and a plausible hypothesis but it's virtually impossible to test. Many different chemicals have been proposed to this. Some are chemicals that we know are produced by the brain like endorphins, and some are just hypothetically produced by the brain. But the ones that we know are produced by the brain are produced in, in very small amounts for a very short period of time, often just a single burst. And we don't even know where in the brain we should look for these things. So it's very hard to do this. Plus, how do you go about sampling the brain when someone is in the middle of a near-death crisis. So these are interesting speculations, but there's really no way to test them. There have also been reports of abnormal electrical activity in the brain near death that may be causing seizure-like activity, which manifests in hallucinations of a near-death experience. This originally came from observations that people with temporal lobe seizures uh, have NDE-like activity. And therefore, a lot of the uh, uh, focus has been on uh, temp the temporal lobe. However, recent research, both here and in the UK, 
has shown that if you look at hundreds of, near, of people who have temporal lobe seizures, you don't find anyone who has anything remotely like a near-death experience. This uh, fallacious report that there's near-death experiences induced by uh, temporal lobe seizures has led some neuroscientists to stimulate the temporal lobe to try to induce near-death experiences. And some, such as uh, Olaf Blanca in, in Switzerland, have claimed that they can reliably produce out-of-body experiences by stimulating the temporal lobe. But when we actually read their research, what they're talking about are bizarre somatic hallucinations, such as a feeling of your legs getting shorter or longer, or a sense of sliding off the operating table. And they're interpreting these as out-of-body experiences. Well, they're not. There have also been reports that there is a surge of electrical activity after, for about 30 seconds after death. And this came from one study at the University of Michigan of rats that were sacrificed while their brain uh, EEGs were being monitored. And what they found was that there was a 30 second burst of activity after the, the rats were killed. It's a mistake to call it a surge because when you actually look at their report, it's a tiny fraction of the electrical activity going on before they were, they were killed. So it's not a lot of activity and it's only for 30 seconds. And furthermore, this has never been shown in humans. We know very well what happens in humans uh, when their hearts stop. And within a matter of seconds, the brain goes flat, the flat EEG goes flat, they flat line, and within 20 seconds, there's no activity in the brain. So this does not seem to be uh, a valid uh, hypothesis. There are also psychological explanations that have been proposed. And the most common one is expectation or wishful thinking. And as we mentioned before, there are a lot of NDEs, in fact, most of them, that contradict what people were expecting to see. Furthermore, um, there are many people, maybe 40% of people who have near-death experiences report encountering deceased loved ones. Now that can be easily dismissed by skeptics as wishful thinking. However, there are a number of well-documented cases now in which people see deceased individuals who were not known at the time to have died, which kind of takes expectation off the table. Uh, this is not a new phenomenon. Pliny the Elder wrote about one when, uh, by a, um, a Roman nobleman in the first century uh, uh, AD. Um, and about a decade ago, I published a paper with about 30 of these cases. Um, one of them that I encountered myself, I'm, I'm gonna save that one for later. Um, but there are also reports that, or claims that NDEs are related to mental illness, or in fact, a sign of mental illness. Well, as a psychiatrist, it's easy for me to study this. So I looked at the incidence of near-death experiences among people who came for the hospital for psychiatric treatment. And I found that the incidence of NDEs among these people who had diagnosed mental illness was the same as it was among people who don't have mental illness. No more, no less. I also looked at the incidence of mental illness among people who had NDEs. And I found that again, it was the same as people who don't have NDEs, neither more nor less. So there's no association between mental illness and near-death experiences, positive or negative. Now, there are some near-death experiences who continue to hear voices long after the NDE. Psychiatrist Mitch Leister and I did a study of these people, and we compared their attitudes toward the voices with the attitudes of psychotic patients towards the voices they hear. And what we found was that they are very different phenomena. Near-death experiences almost exclusively like hearing the voices, feel comforted or reassured or guided by these voices and do not want them to stop. They feel that these voices enrich their lives. By contrast, almost all the psychotic patients did not like hearing the voices. They found them frightening and attacking them. They felt that these voices uh, diminished their lives, interfered with their lives, and they desperately wanted them to stop. So these are very different phenomena, hearing voices as a part of a psychosis and in the aftermath of an NDE. Several clinicians have published papers pointing out the contrast between near-death experiences and hallucinations or delusions. They differ vastly in the context in which they occur, 
in the content, the detail, the consistency of the content, in the way they're remembered later on. Memories, as I said before, of NDEs don't change over decades, whereas memories of hallucinations, like memories of dreams, don't last very long. And most importantly, they differ greatly in their after effects. And that's what I want to turn to now, because I think this is probably the most important aspect of near-death experiences. There is a very consistent pattern of after effects from NDEs. The most common things pe ping, ping people reports, people's, people report is that they have a decreased fear of death, or in most cases, a totally absent fear of death after the NDE. I have to say, when I, as a psychiatrist, when I first heard this, I was a little scared that this is going to make people suicidal when they hear about this. Because I had known people who were contemplating taking their lives, but uh, resisted doing that because they were afraid of what might happen if they did that. And if they hear that there's nothing to be afraid of after you die, is that going to make them more suicidal? Well, being a scientist, I decided to do a study of it. So I interviewed everybody admitted to my hospital with a suicide attempt. And I compared those who had a near-death experience as a result of the suicide attempt with those who didn't. And I followed them up then month by month. And what I found was that those who had an NDE as a result of the suicide attempt were much less suicidal afterwards than those who didn't have an NDE. And that seemed counterintuitive to me. So I asked the NDEers to explain that. And they said things like, I learned in my near-death experience that there's a purpose to everything that happens. So now I know that the problems I was having before and that I still have are not things to be avoided or run away from, but there are challenges I'm supposed to learn something from and they welcome dealing with them. Furthermore, they say that if you lose your fear of dying, you also lose your fear of living. If you're not afraid of losing your life, then you're not afraid of jumping in with both feet, living life to the fullest, taking risks you wouldn't have taken otherwise. And that leads you to have a much fuller life, a much more meaningful and fulfilling life, which makes you less suicidal. Now, I wanna add here that this is, these after effects of NDEs are very different from the after effects of coming close to death without an NDE. Most people who come close to death, for example, as a heart from a heart attack, become, uh, they, they value their life much more afterwards, whether you've had an NDE or not. However, if you haven't had an NDE, you also become much more afraid of losing your life, which makes you much more cautious, much more fearful, much more conservative in your behavior. You don't take as many risks. Whereas if you had an NDE, you're not afraid of losing your life. So you tend to live more fully more openly, take more risks, and enjoy life much more. As a doctor, I should add that this makes them harder to treat. Uh, when you tell someone who's had a heart attack they need to stop smoking, um, they say, sure, I don't want to die, I'll, I'll stop smoking. If you tell an end ear they, they, at that, they say, well, you know, if I enjoy smoking, why should I give it up? I don't care if I die. End ears also say that they decrease they have a decreased value that they attach to worldly things, things like material possessions, uh, competition, um, fame, prestige, power. These things don't mean the same thing to them anymore. Now, I wanna differentiate between enjoying things and being addicted to them. Because near-death experiencers, since they tend to enjoy things more fully, still enjoy having worldly things. They still like the taste of good food, I feel of a nice, comfortable chair, um, but they don't become addicted to them. When they lose those things, when their car is repossessed, they don't get upset the way other people would do it. So they enjoy things, but don't really miss them when they're gone. They're not addicted to material possessions. Near-death experiences also report a greatly enhanced sense of spirituality. They feel much more connected to other people, to the natural world, to the universe, and to the divine. They see the divine in everybody. And that makes them much more compassionate, much more caring. And they tend to live by the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, which is a precept of almost every religion we have. 
But near-death experiences say things like, for me now, the golden rule is not just a guideline we're supposed to follow. Now I realize this is a law of the universe, like the law of gravity here on earth. You can't avoid it. The golden rule is a law of nature and you can't avoid it. When you hurt someone else, you are hurting yourself. When you help someone else, you are helping yourself. New death experiences will say that they are more spiritual than they were before, but not more religious. They tend not to, uh, not to become involved in the particular dogma of any one particular religion. They say that they feel equally at home in any house of worship of any denomination, or in fact, just out in nature communing with God. I've also seen similar changes in people who were atheists before their NDE. Even if they had no concept of a deity before this, or actively disbelieved in a deity before this, once they encounter it in the NDE, they can no longer deny it. And they accept this against their will as just this is what happened to me. These changes in attitudes and spirituality also lead to changes in behavior. NDEers become much more altruistic after their NDE. They tend to volunteer more. They tend to value relationships much more than things. Now, these all sound like wonderful changes, but there are problems with these as well. Uh, for example, I have seen marriages break up. I've seen careers change because of these changes in attitudes. I've known people who were in violent professions, for example. One fellow I knew was a uh, police officer who actually had his NDE when he bled out in, in surgery. And after he came back from his NDE and rehab, he rehab from it, he tried to go back into the field and almost got his partner shot because he found he couldn't shoot his gun. The idea of shooting someone else was just unthinkable to him. So he had to leave the police force. And he actually went back to school and became a teacher. And I've heard similar stories from career military officers who found they couldn't continue in that career. I've talked to people who were in cutthroat businesses who came back from an NDE thinking that getting ahead of someone else's expense makes no sense anymore. And they end up either leaving their business or changing the way they do it. So they treat their customers and their competitors much more compassionately than they did before. Some near death experiencers when they immediately return from the NDE are angry about that or sad about it. And they often take that out against the doctors if they were brought back by a doctor, they get furious at, why did you bring me back? I found that the best way of helping people deal with that is to put them together with other near-death experiences who have dealt with this same issue in the past. And they can share with each other how that felt, what they did to get over it and so forth. Many people find that even though they're comfortable with the NDE, other people are not. And they still feel themselves being ridiculed or labeled as crazy because of the NDE. Or on the other side, they may feel that others uh, put them on a pedestal and expect them to be saintly, even though they're still human beings with the same personalities that we all have. Some NDEers end up seeking help from professionals. And we're in the middle of a study now at the University of Virginia looking at end ears who do seek help. What issues cause them to seek help? What types of professionals do they seek help from? What type of help do they seek? What are the barriers to finding help? When they do get help, what types of help do they get? What do they find helpful? What do they find not helpful? So what are the larger implications of NDEs? beyond the individual experiencer. Well, people, in, in, especially in academia, often argue about whether NDEs are biological events or whether they're uh, spiritual events. I would argue that this is, this is a false dichotomy. Um, let me give you an analogy. The desks that I work at can be described in physical terms as made of wood, and rectangular and a very dark brown. And that's an accurate description of my desk, but it's not a complete description. I could also say that this was my grandfather's desk that he left to me when he died, and it's his legacy to me. 
And that's an emotional or spiritual description of my desk. And it's accurate, but it's not complete. You can't really understand my desk unless you know both the physical and the emotional or spiritual definitions of it or descriptions of it. And I would say the same is true of near-death experiences. You can't understand them fully unless you understand both the biological things that are going on in the body and the brain that trigger it or allow it and the spiritual aspects of it. Near-death experiences also have profound implications for how we think about the mind and the brain. I was taught to, break, to, to think that the mind is just what the brain does. And I think most of us are. The idea that the brain creates all our thoughts and our feelings. Of course, we've been studying the, the brain for hundreds of years now. And we still have not the slightest hint of a clue of a suggestion of how a chemical or physical process in the brain can create a thought, but that's okay, we'll get it someday. And in everyday life, in fact, it looks as if the mind and the brain are the same. When you get intoxicated, you don't think very clearly. If you get hit on the head or have a stroke, that affects your thinking. So it does seem in everyday life as if the mind and the brain are the same thing. However, in extreme circumstances like the NDE, you seem to have consciousness continuing and even improving when the brain activity is diminished or stopped. Um, physician Larry Dossi said, after uh, looking at all the evidence, that we are conscious not because of the brain, but in spite of it. This evidence certainly comes from NDEs, in which you think clearer than ever before when your brain is shutting down. But there are other phenomena as well. There's something called terminal lucidity in which people who have end-stage dementia like Alzheimer's disease, who haven't been able to recognize family for months or years, haven't been able to communicate, suddenly become perfectly lucid, recognize friends and family, carry on coherent conversations, and then in a matter of hours or sometimes days, they die. Medicine has no explanation for how this can be. Your brain cannot regenerate when you have something like Alzheimer's disease. But suppose the brain de uh, deteriorates sufficiently at that point that it releases its hold on the mind. That would explain it. In addition, we have psychedelic drug research in the last decade in doing neuroimaging of the brain under people with people having psychedelic drug trips. A lot of this is done at, the, at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore and Imperial College in London, where with a variety of psychedelics, they have found that the more elaborate mystical experiences with psychedelic drugs are associated with a decrease in electrical activity in the brain. We always thought these drugs works by stimulating the brain, creating more activity, creating hallucinations, and it's just the opposite. What these drugs do is shut down the brain, minimize the connections between different parts of the brain, allowing the mind to access these spiritual realms. So how do we understand why the brain seems to be connected to mind in everyday life, but not in these extreme circumstances? One model is that the brain works as a filter. It filters out in everyday life, all this miscellaneous spiritual nonsense, and just lets in the important stuff. An analogy is a radio or TV set. Um, there are thousands of radio stations out there all the time. And if you tried to listen to all of them at once, you wouldn't be able to understand anything. So a radio tuner allows you to select one particular channel, one particular station, and filters out all the others. So you can hear that one station clearly. In the same way, the brain may decide that there's too much going on in consciousness to be able to understand it all. So we're gonna filter it out and just let in the small number of stuff that's really important. This is not a new idea. Hippocrates wrote about this 2000 years ago. He said, the brain is the interpreter of the mind. Now this makes sense in terms of evolution because the brain evolved as a physical organ to help us survive in the physical world, just like all our other organs do. Your eyes don't let in the entire electromagnetic spectrum. It filters out the infrared, the ultraviolet, 
just lets in that small part of the electromagnetic spectrum that's relevant to our survival in the physical world. Likewise, our ears don't let in all the sound frequencies that are out there, just the ones we need to hear. So what do we need to survive? We need what's gonna help us find food and shelter and a mate and so forth. Well, communing with, with uh, divine beings or with deceased loved ones isn't gonna help you find food and shelter. So let's filter all those out. We'll just let in the important stuff, how to, get, how to survive in the physical world. But there are circumstances like NDEs in which the brain is shutting down and the filter gets weaker and weaker and maybe shut off entirely. And when the brain stops filtering, we have access to all this other stuff. So this also has implications for whether we survive death or not. If the mind can function without the brain, in fact, better without the brain, that opens up the possibility that it can survive after the brain dies. It doesn't prove it, but it opens up that possibility. But there's evidence from NDEs that we do survive death. I mentioned before uh, near-death experiences in which people see deceased loved ones who no one knew had died. Let me give you an example of this. A fellow I knew was a 25-year-old uh, uh, technical writer who was admitted to the hospital with severe pneumonia. And he was having repeated respiratory arrest episodes where he couldn't breathe. And his primary nurse who was with him every day was a young woman named Anita about his age. And one day she told him she was gonna be taking the long weekend off and there'd be other nurses substituting for her. So he said goodbye, sent her on her way. And over that weekend while she was gone, he had another respiratory arrest where he had to be resuscitated. And during that arrest, he had an, a near death experience in which he found himself in a beautiful pastoral scene. And there to his surprise was Anita walking towards him, his nurse. He did a double take and said, Anita, what are you doing here? So she came up to him and said, Jack, you can't stay here. You need to go back. But I want you to do me a favor. I want you to find my parents and tell them, I'm sorry, I wrecked the red MGB. And then she turned and walked away. He then woke up back in his body in his hospital bed with a complete memory of this vivid experience. And the next time a nurse walked into his room, he started to tell her about this. She got very upset and ran out of the room. It turned out that his nurse, Anita, had taken the weekend off to celebrate her 21st birthday. And her parents had surprised her with the gift of a, of a red MGB. She got excited, hopped in the car, took off for a drive, lost control of the car and smashed into a telephone pole, dying instantly shortly before Jack had his near-death experience. There's no way he could have expected that she was going to die. And certainly no way he could have known how she died. And yet he did. How? He says, because she told me. So this strongly suggests that something about Anita survived her death and was able to communicate to Jack from the other side. That doesn't prove that we survive for eternity. Uh, this was hours after Anita died. Maybe we survived for six hours, for 12 hours, for three days. Who knows? However, many near-death experiencers report encountering deceased individuals who have been dead for decades, deceased parents, grandparents, who seem to have been gone for many, many years, and then are still there to communicate with them. So it suggests that we do survive after death. So what does this mean for all of us, those of us who have an NDEs as well as the NDEers? There are certain takeaways I want you all to remember. The first is that near-death experiences are incredibly common. Research from the US, from Europe, and from Australia has suggested that NDEs 
happen to about 5% of the general population. That's one out of every 20 people. That means someone in your family, someone in your classroom, someone in your workplace has probably had an NDE. Number two, near-death experiences are normal experiences that happen to normal people under abnormal circumstances. They have nothing to do with mental illness. They're not reflective of a hallucination or delusion. They are normal experiences. Number three, near-death experiences have profound after effects, both positive and negative, which need to be acknowledged and addressed. Number four, NDE suggests that the mind can function independent of the brain. In fact, can function better independent of the brain. And if that's true, then number five follows that the mind may be able to function beyond death when the brain has died, the, the mind or the soul or the spirit can continue to function after death. And NDE strongly suggests that we are all interconnected. People say, give, me, give the example of a hand. If you look at the five fingers, it looks like they're, they're individual things that aren't connected. But if you look at the palm, the whole hand, you see they really are connected and you can't affect one without affecting all of them. If you believe this is true, then you live according to the golden rule. And that, as end years tell us, makes life much more meaningful and much more fulfilling. I think that's about all I'm gonna say at this point, but I'll tell you that, I'll give you a shameless uh, plug from a book which goes into all this in much more detail including uh, quotes from about 100 near-death experiencers. And if you want to contact me, here's how to reach me. Thank you. It's great. If I can get you to stop screen sharing, please, Bruce. Great. There we go. And I'll put myself on the screen with you. So thank you, Bruce. That was an absolutely outstanding presentation. So thank you so much. I mean, the comments were, uh, people were raving in the, in the chat section while you were talking about how this is such important information that has to be out there. And I know that's what you've been trying to do for the last 40 years. Yes. <laughs> All righty. So uh, let's go look at some of the questions that we have here. Uh, lots of them. Okay, there's so many comments. Uh, I'm sorry, if people, if I miss your, your question. Here's one. Have you ever encountered, this one's from Joshua. Thank you, Joshua. Have you ever encountered NDEs that were unconscious, which means the person does not remember the NDE, but has many of the characteristic traits of NDE after effects? Um, I have not, but other people have told me about these things. Um, PMH Outwater has talked about people who don't, have, don't remember their NDEs, um, but have some of the after effects. Um, I have not. And in our, in our research, we've, we've compared people who have a close brush with death without an NDE, we do not see the after effects in those people. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think obviously the near death experience is not the only way to reach this spiritual state. There are many other ways through meditation, through psychedelic drugs, uh, spontaneously. Um, so, some of these people that um, don't seem to have NDEs but still have the same after effects may have a spiritual event from some other cause. Mm -hmm. Well put. We have an interesting question here from John Sparr. He says, uh, Dr. Grayson, you mentioned the fallacious idea that electrical activity causes NDEs. Another researcher from Laurentian University, Michael Persinger, <laughs> which I'm sure you're familiar with, stimulated portions of subjects' brains with what I remember as positive results. To your recollection, how did this study finally or actually turn out? Yes, uh, uh, Michael Persinger used uh, magnetic fields rather than electrical fields. And he put a helmet on people's heads um, that induced an electromagnetic field, a magnetic field 
uh, at certain parts of the brain. And he reported that people report all the features of a near-death experience as a result of this. There was a group in Sweden, um, per, per Van, uh, Granquist and his team, who came to Laurentian um, and studied with Persinger and see how, saw how he did it and got one of Persinger's own helmets and took it back to Sweden with them and did research with it. And they found that if you tell people in advance what to expect, they will report having a near-death experience with this, whether or not the helmet is turned on. If you don't tell people what to expect, they will not get the, the NDE, whether or not the helmet is turned on. So they said that this is expect, this is, uh, you tell people what to expect and it's a placebo effect, they will have it. It's not, nothing to do with the magnetic uh, field. Thank you, that's great. This question is from Dr. Terry Daniel, and she asks, if NDEs happen when the brain is flatlined, then how would the presence of drugs or meds in the body be able to inhibit an NDE since the physiology is no longer functioning? Would it not be more accurate to say that the drugs inhibit the patient's ability to remember an NDE? Yes, yes. Great commentary, yes, that's, that's true. Uh, what we know is that these drugs um, and lack of oxygen for that matter, it reduced the number of reports we hear from people about NDEs. We don't know whether they had them and don't remember them or just never had them. And of course, that's one of the problems with NDEs. We don't know what people experience. We know what they remember of what they can understand and what they choose to tell us about their experience. So we're dealing with the reports, not the experience itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have another interesting question. This one's from Dr. Francis Liu. And he says, are there accurate depictions of NDEs in feature films or documentaries? Do you have a top three list? <laughs> I have a top one list. Uh, oh. <laughs> there, there are a great many um, uh, near, uh, uh, movies and, and now there's even comic strips on television shows. I mean, even, even Bert Bart Simpson has a, an NDE now. Um, but John Migliaccio, uh, a New Death Experiencer from New York, has actually done a study of this. And he found them going back to the 1930s. Um, uh, Frederick March was in a, in, a, in a movie, I'm blocking on the name now, um, in, in 1930, 31, that depicted an NDE. My favorite is Resurrection, uh, the original version with Ellen Burstyn, uh, which I think is the best account, not only of the near death experience, but of the positive and the negative after effects of the NDE, trying to get along in a society that doesn't know anything about these things, doesn't treasure them. So I would recommend the original version of uh, Resurrection. Uh, there was a remake that uh, did not do as well with it, but the original with uh, Ellen Burstyn is an excellent uh, depiction of an NDE. Um, some people have said that even uh, The Wizard of Oz is a near-death experience. Um, she's hit on the head, goes to another realm. So, you know, there are all sorts of things that can be called NDEs that really aren't. Hmm. Interesting. I'm going to have to watch that Ellen Burstyn one. I haven't yeah. seen that one. <laughs> and here is a question from Tim. He says, being a UVA, does your work over being at UVA, I'm sorry, does your work overlap with that of Jim Tucker? Uh -huh. If so, how do your studies combined with his influence your views on the concept of reincarnation? To me, reincarnation and karma make a lot of sense in light of these studies. What do you think? Yeah, uh, uh, Jim and I, our office is right next door. We work together uh, quite a lot. Um, there are a lot of problems with the, I, I could say that he and Ian Stevenson before him have collected more than 2,000 cases of young children aged two, three, and four who claim to remember a past life. And in about half of these cases, they've been able to find the family the child claimed to have been a part of previously and find that, that, that what the child says is completely accurate. Uh, so the child obviously has information about his past life that he couldn't have gotten by normal means. And these are you know preschool kids. They haven't read about the other life. They haven't heard about it on TV and so forth. Um, and they're almost never about a famous person anyway. They're, they're you know, a coal miner in the next town or something like this. But there are a lot of problems with these cases uh, that don't fit our common ideas about reincarnation. Uh, for example, there are some cases in which 
two children who live at the same time remember the same past life mm -hmm. and have accurate information about that past life. Or there may be a child who remembers two past lives that occurred at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, there are also children who remember a past life accurately of someone who died when the child was six months old. So what was going on in that child's life for the first six months before that soul came into it? Um, so these don't say that, the, that these aren't reincarnation. It's saying that our models of reincarnation are too simplistic to account for all the data. Now, you asked about the, the overlap between NDEs and, um, and reincarnation. A small number of children who report past lives report also the period between lives. And Jim and a medical student, uh, Poonam Sharma, looked at children from Myanmar who reported a past life in the memory between lives. And they found that the way they described the period between lives was very much like the way people from that culture described near-death experience, the other realm of near-death experience. So they're giving us the same experience about what happens in the other realm. Additionally, I can say that there are a few near-death experiences I've encountered in which the life review is not limited to this life, but includes details from a past life. Um, many of you may have read uh, Anita Morjani's book, Dying to Be Me, and she describes um, in a past life in which she knew her brother. Um, in this life, her brother was older than she is. In the past life, she remembered she was older than he was. Uh, now that's a type of, of near-death memory that cannot really be corroborated because she didn't know where the other life was and so forth. But there are some other accounts I've heard where the person brought back information that could be verified from various records or through other people, where they came back with detailed information about a past life that they remembered in their life review. Um, so there does seem to be something like reincarnation that's going on, that our lives are not limited to this one particular lifetime. Thank you, Bruce. Um, our next question is from Mindy, and she says, in your view, what do NDEs tell us about the purpose and experience here on Earth or various other than human beings, animals besides humans, plants, trees, minerals, water, air? Thank you. So purpose. Wow, that's a big question. Mm -hmm. uh, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, you know, I've asked this of many near death experiencers, and they tell me the purpose that they came back for, meaning just something like to, uh, to raise my children or to help my father die or something, something very limited. But they don't get to the point of why we're here on the physical realm in the first place or why we need to be here, what we need to do or learn while we're here. Um, if you try to pin near death experiences down on that, they may give you a vague answer or inconsistent answers. And I think we just don't know the answer or probably more likely our language doesn't permit us to verbalize the answer. Thank you, Bruce. We have lots of questions. Uh, Jennifer asks, some NDEers say nothing in life is random, that there are no coincidences. Others say free will creates the trajectory uh, of the random events of our human lives. Which opinion experience have you seen most in your research on NDEers, that life events are random or life events are planned? Um, I, I don't think there's a contradiction here. Um, I, I think planned is maybe too strong a word, but there are no, they, most NDEers say there are no coincidences, that everything happens for a reason, for a purpose. And that doesn't uh, rule out the possibility of free will. Uh, you may be still be given free will, which doesn't mean your actions are random. Um, so I think there is a general overall purpose to thing, to everything. But within that larger purpose, we are allowed to express our free will as a way of getting to this purpose. Uh, let me also add that I have no idea what I'm talking about. This is just what end of your say to me. And I don't know firsthand anything about this. 
Well, you've spoken to a lot of NDEers, yeah. Bruce, and this is what they're asking from what they've told you. Our next question comes from Bob, and he says, can you discuss about people who've had negative after effects of an NDE, those people who are worse off than before their NDE? Hmm. Most of the people who find themselves worse off are people who've had it fairly recently and haven't had time to learn how to live with this experience. Um, again, I, I have tried to work with people one-to-one uh, -one in psychotherapy, trying to deal with the issues that come up and I found very little success with that because I always end up with them saying, well, you don't understand what it's like because you haven't been there. So I found that support groups with, with like with the ion support groups where you get a bunch of NDEers together or even just one-to-one -one meeting with another NDEer who's been down the road before are much more helpful in getting someone over this, these negative um, after effects. Um, some of them may just be attitude adjustments and some are, are real physical problems that have come up after the NDE. Um, but the, the feeling that my life is worth, worse off after this usually doesn't last that long because people eventually realize what I'm back here for and they adjust their thinking so that they can, they can live with this and in fact, grow from it. Um, I was add that Nancy Evans Bush, who's written tremendous amount about um, unpleasant near-death experiences, and also then about the after effects, uh, says that um, she, it, it's sort of like the, uh, the hero's journey that, that Joseph Campbell talks about, that people often find they have to go through some struggles to get to the eventual state of enlightenment. And this is all part of it, the negative after effects, as well as the negative part of the NDE is all a way of, for us to get through these challenges to get to the eventual goal of, of seeing, understanding what's going on in enlightenment. All right, Andrew is asking you, Dr. Grayson, does learning and researching NDEs and what they mean ever give you an existential anxiety? <laughs> it has uh, for me a bit, and I want to know what you feel and think. Uh, I, I would say just the opposite. It has relieved my existential anxiety. Uh, you know, I went into this field as a, a materialistic scientist thinking that science has the answer to everything. And I was uncomfortable with not having the answer to everything. And now I understand that we're not gonna have all the answers, that some questions are not answerable by science. And some answers are beyond the ability of our brains to understand. So I am very comfortable with not having the answers, with not understanding them. And I suspect that once I die, I will understand them. I don't know for sure, but that's what people tell me. So I suspect that uh, it's fine not having the answers here. And it's, that has relieved my existential anxiety. <laughs> awesome. Uh, this next question is from Gary. I don't know if you're gonna be able to answer it, but maybe you can. Uh, psychedelic agents like psilocybin, are very effective in addressing existential anxiety in those with terminal conditions. Mm. How might this relate to the NDE? Mm. Is there the possibility of being vaccinated against the fear of death that is common to both NDEs and psychedelic enhanced experience? Mm. Uh, the best research currently with, with uh, psilocybin is at Johns Hopkins, um, and they have found that sometimes just one dose of psilocybin can produce long lasting decrease in fear of death and enhance spirituality. Now, let me say this is not giving someone a pill and saying, go home and take this and see what happens. Uh, these are people who come into the lab and in a very comforting uh, environment with you know, low lighting and soft music and someone there to help you to, to process things with you over many hours, you have a beautiful spiritual experience that has nice after effects, decreases your, your death anxiety and makes you feel comfortable with this. And this is also the way they do it with terminally ill patients. They give them the drug with a lot of support and a lot of guidance. Um, so it's not just a matter of the drug itself, it's the drug with the setting, with the guidance to process what's going on for you. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say a, a related thing is that uh, ketamine is being used now by some people to treat depression. Uh, 
It's not a popular treatment because it has to be given IV at this point. And few people want to take uh, an injection to treat the depression when they can take a pill for it. But ketamine can also produce a profound spiritual experiences. And some people who have used ketamine to treat depression have claimed that the spiritual experience is a therapeutic part of the whole experience. That if you don't get the spiritual experience, the spiritual experience, you don't get the antidepressant effect. That has not been shown in studies yet. It's just the anecdotal reports of some therapists who use this. But that may be another clue to what's going on with this. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Mindy. And Mindy said, she'd like to know, how much interest in this NDE research do you see among younger generations, including students in the sciences? There's been a tremendous change since I started doing this uh, 40, 50 years ago. When we first started talking about this at the American Medical Association in 1980, no one had heard about this. No one knew what we were talking about. And there was polite silence in the audience. And you know, we didn't know whether people took us seriously or not. And now when we talk in conferences about it, it's rare that doctors don't stand up and say, let me tell you about my near-death experience. So it's, it's very common now and very accepted by doctors. There's still a lot of controversy, legitimate, about what's causing the ND, what their ultimate me meaning is. But doctors generally accept that these are important experiences that are happening to their patients and that affect their patients' care. So they want to know about it and they're eager to be educated about it. So I've given grand rounds talks in medicine, in um, family medicine, in pediatrics, in neurology throughout the hospital. And it's usually very popular with them. It's very well received. And that wouldn't have happened um, a decade or two ago. There have also been some interesting studies now of scientists in general, not just physicians. Done, there's one done in Scotland, one in Belgium, one in Brazil, and one in the US asking about their attitudes towards mind and brain. And what each one of these studies has shown is that 50% of scientists say that the mind and the brain are separate things. You would not have gotten that 40, 50 years ago. I don't know whether it's because of increased education now, uh, whether if we follow the same cohort through the, through the decades, they would change their attitudes, or whether it's just that younger scientists now have a more enlightened attitude than the older ones do. I expect it's some of both, but I've certainly seen in students that I teach that there's more open to it, openness to it now than there was 20, 30, 40 years ago. That's wonderful. The next question is from Brian Sackett, and he is asking you, would you please comment on the shared death experience, oh. addressing concerns about drugs or electrical effects on the brain because the person expects experiencing the same NDE effects is not dying, nor that, subjected to <laughs> abnormal brain activity. Yes, yes. Uh, it's, it's not well studied. Raymond Moody wrote a book about it uh, with just anecdotes, and, and that's all I've heard, uh, just anecdotes, um, that people who are often accompanying the, uh, the, the that person who's dying, either by the deathbed or distant but emotionally attached to them, will feel at least part of the near-death experience as the person is dying. And they re may report going with them to the mouth of the tunnel and they're not going all the way in, or just uh, experiencing some of the same effects of the NDE with them. Uh, and it's not, it's not commonly reported, but I've got probably 20 or 30 cases in my files of people who reported the same type of thing. And they have a lot of the same after effects. They become much more spiritual as a result after this. And as you said, as far as we know, their brains are perfectly normal at the time. Nothing going on with them. Thank you, Bruce. I actually write it, have been writing about this in my books for 20 years. I yes. call it the death watch experience. Yes. So we have another one uh, from the Doman family. Uh, and uh, you may have partially answered this, yes. but I'm not sure. Are the after effects of NDEs like experiences with LSD or awaska? I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, it, they, they can be. Uh, the effects with, with uh, NDEs are fairly consistent. The effects with other drugs are less consistent. Um, ayahuasca is an interesting uh, um, example because that seems to be one of the closest uh, correlates to the NDE. Uh, we tried to do a study of this with a group in, in Ecuador who were uh, using ayahuasca. 
And there were some problems with the way the study was set up and it didn't work out the way you hoped to. But uh, Mitch Leister in Colorado was still trying to pursue this, looking at cor correlations between the ayahuasca experience and the NDE. Again, with the ayahuasca, it's almost always given with a guide or a guru to help you through the, the experience. And that's not the case with NDEs, mm -hmm. at least no human guide. Uh, we have another question from Gary, um, who may be a physician, I'm not quite sure. The NDE association with enhanced consciousness with absent brain activity has been used by Bernardo Kastrup to make the argument that consciousness is primary and that the brain is a manifestation of consciousness rather than consciousness being a product of the brain. How do you feel about this general idea that consciousness is primary and materiality derivative? Um, I don't go as far as Bernardo does. I've had debates with him about this. Um, I see both the brain and the spirit or mind or whatever you want to call it as being different aspects of us. Um, you know, most materialists say that the, the mind is totally a product of the, of the brain. And Bernardo goes the other way and says, no, the brain is totally a product of the mind. Um, he doesn't believe that the physical world has a reality independent of the mind. And that's going too far for me. I think they're both, they're both real and they both interact. And I'm not sure they're separate things. They may be like two sides of a coin. I don't think you can have one without the other. But they're, I th the way I experience them, they're equally uh, primary. Um, I don't have a logical way to argue against Bernardo. His arguments are logically internally consistent and there's no evidence against them or for, or for them. Uh, it's a philosophical position, um, but it's uh, personally distasteful to me to think, to think that the physical world is not real. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Well, we are out of time. There were many, many, many more questions that we weren't able to get to. And I would just uh, like to thank you very much, Bruce, for this incredible, uh, talk, which was just jam packed with information. And congratulations again for being inducted into our spiritual awakening circle of honor. And Thank you, people, his new book, Awake.